the gerbils mate, and they could watch the gerbils mate and see what happens. And Teddy reminded me the gerbils ate their babies, so we decided that, that demonstration bombed. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, of course, what Wayne and you have both said is that the most important thing you can do is be an example, and I don't mean you have sex in front of your kids, but mm. to be comfortable talking about sex and to show affection and uh, love and at least be available to answer questions. But I'd be very interested if either of you have been more formal and explicit well, in your discussions. With I had kids. the experience as a kid of my father taking me aside, for which I'm eternally grateful, and explaining to me, asking me what I wanted to know, and I had difficulty, and he began explaining. Uh, I have daughters. It seems to me that one of the things that I believe uh, that the parent of a child of the opposite sex uh, should not overstimulate a child. It is not the province of a father, it seems to me, to talk to a daughter about these things, which are, after all, uh, stimulating in a way that you don't want it to be. Uh, it seems to me that uh, had I a son, I would indeed talk to a son. My wife indeed talks uh, uh, to my eldest daughter, who's 15. Uh, I believe, in terms of example, I'm a Puritan in terms of, I do not believe that nudity is called for ever. I think, again, parent and child of the opposite sex. I do believe that a child can be easily overstimulated and frightened by an appearance uh, uh, by a parent of an opposite sex to be nude. And that is a rule in our house. Uh, and I think that's something which is very important. You try not to overstimulate. At the same time, you must go back to the problem of how can you give a human being a sense of self-worth and worthiness. Mm. Wayne? I, uh take showers with my daughter, <laughs> I'll tell you this, <laughs> but uh, they're only little children. I have an 18-year-old, obviously, and an 11-year-old that uh, I don't, but nudity has never been a problem in, in our home. And each, again, each, each home has to make their own decisions mm -hmm. about that. I have, uh, I've never concerned myself with it. I've taken baths with my little babies uh, all the time. I play with them in there. I, they, they come into the bedroom uh, regularly. Uh, we don't have sex in front of my children, although I've been caught a few times, um, mm -hmm. and when they just kind of walked in. Uh, in the middle of the night, the. Um, I mean, what'd you say? Daddy's not <laughs> mommy. I said, Daddy's playing horsey. <laughs> That's what they think it is. Huh? So we have all these little horsies at home. We play horsey a lot. <laughs> uh, I've never made a big deal about it. See, I think, I think the key in what we've all been talking about here is honesty, and I don't think you should be artificial in your uh, relationship with your children about anything. Nor do I think you should be uh, sexually. I grew up in an orphanage. All right. I uh, never had a father. My father abandoned my mother when I was uh, very, very young, and my mother had three uh, boys to raise. Two of us went into an orphanage. My oldest brother went with my grandmother. Uh, it wasn't until I was a teenager that I was back with my mother, who never uh, took the time to sit down with us and explain uh, anything to us. And in the orphanage, we would just sort of all get together, and there was. There was the National Geographic days and, uh, you know, the pictures and uh, the books with the little things that we would under... Well, I'm not saying that that's the best way to learn it. With my five daughters, I have talked openly about it. It isn't anything that we hush-hush about. Whatever, uh, you know, my body is just a, a part of, of who I am. And when they see me, they don't make a big, they, they don't make a big deal about it. They're not terrified. Uh, as, as they get a little bit older, they, they become embarrassed about that and I yes. think move on in their own the, way. The first rule of medicine, you know, Fred, is do no harm. And I think that applies to raising yeah. kids, too. And there are obviously different ways to communicate sure. about sexuality. Hugh and I are obviously much more Victorian than, <laughs> than Wayne is. But in clinical practice, what I see are tremendous numbers of people who just don't know anything about sex. Even if they've been raised right. in the sexual revolution, they're ignorant because they've been raised in a house of mystery. And other people have been taught this wonderful combination that sex is awful. Don't touch right. down there. Mm -hmm. Don't think about it. Don't down talk there about it. That's an interesting word because I have... But it's the most beautiful <laughs> gift you can give yeah. your spouse on the yeah. wedding day. I think, now, wait a minute, how does it, this, is, this <laughs> dirty you, thing is it. the most beautiful yeah. thing I can yeah. give. So they're hopelessly confused yeah. and guilty and burdened with a sense of evil. I would say one of the things that you can possibly do is do not make a child guilty about autoeroticism, mm. about masturbation, which is a ubiquitous human yes, experience. Yes, exactly. You yes. must tell yeah, them that. Be natural and, and yes, easy. and <laughs> don't tell them that they're going to go crazy or that, you know, oh. tell them. That's terribly important. And you got it. You can, you, well, I was yeah. shocked. This is I, a, big, that's a big learning thing for me with my little girl because they, uh, they call it pumping, okay? But yeah. I mean, my little girl is like, she's very stimulated that mm -hmm. way. And, it, and, and they go through like this four or five month period. Right. And we just say, look, don't, you know, don't pump uh, right here, okay? Like, it's not in public. Yeah, yeah, right. Just go, uh, but, go yeah. back in some place else. But, but we don't make a big deal about it. She even laughs about it and jokes about it. Where, even.
I'm not going to uh, stand on morals and say that mine are above others, but I am going to take a disagreement to the attitude with which you're approaching human sexuality, some of the ways you're describing your own family lives. In the situation I grew up in, um, I learned about everything that I know today in terms of sex from friends and from the street. What I'm going to say that brought that uh, to an end was some religious experiences, that's fine, and at a time in my life when they were absolutely necessary. What could have changed that would have been to have seen my own parents, my own mother and father, in the role of man and wife, demonstrating before me and before the rest of the kids in the family how to love one another, and not setting up this facade that somehow seems to change after kids are born. The behaviors that a man and a woman came together with prior to kids are the same kind of behaviors that are going to cause that marriage to continue to grow and be a fruitful marriage for their entire lives. When kids come along and you start to change behaviors, restrict behaviors, and put rules on behaviors as to what's proper and improper, the kid grows up with a, a lopsided attitude about what human sexuality is all agreeing. about. I don't think you're disagreeing. Yeah, I don't. I, well, with respect to uh, nudity, with respect to rules, with respect to punishment, those things, uh, some of the statements that you're making, yes, I'm, I am disagreeing too. Punishment is very much a part of what even a man and a woman have with one another, not that they physically abuse one another, but they do have limits to behaviors, and they do interact to check behaviors when those behaviors infringe on the other person. Uh, if you don't do that with the child, where does that child learn what rights uh, of an individual are going to have some kind of a what dominance over the rights of the others who is he interacting with? In terms of sexuality and nudity, uh, if a kid doesn't learn about what's going on between mom and dad at home, where is he going to learn about it? And it seems to me we have a whole generation of folks who have learned about it in a different way. And it seems to me that uh, 50, agreeing 60 with some years of us ago... Disagreeing with others, depending on the subject, <laughs> right? <laughs> so which uh, demonstrates a fundamental you know, I, truth, which I, is there is no I, truth. Well, I think most parents, I don't think they uh, avoid being nude around their children because they think it's the right or wrong thing to do. I think that's who they are. They've grown up with a sense of privacy about their bodies. They were taught this from the time that they were little children. And, and again, and the question for me is, can you change? Can you work on identifying your, in yourself ways in which you want to change and mature and become more than your parents were and more than they gave you? I think it, I had no clothes when I was a kid, so that was just... <laughs> <laughs> so I got used to not having them, and, uh, and I still don't. Uh, Preparing your kids for the harsh realities, the sometimes harsh realities of life. We'll deal with that issue when we come back. Joins us live Thursday at 5. Some of the tough, harsh realities of life, uh, economic problems, poverty, broken families, uh, old age, death of a parent, all of those kinds of things are things that you have to face at one time or another in your life. Uh, how do you prepare a kid for those, those tough things? Most children grow up with a rather benighted life. They never really suffer much mm -hmm. except perhaps the loss of a pet at some point or another. Uh, how do you help them know that sometime down the line, ultimately, they're going to lose things that they love? It's to me, it's like parenting is about two things for me. It's about teaching them an attitude, because I think attitude is everything. I, th I really think your belief system and, and what attitude you have toward things is going to determine a lot more how successful you're going to be, how happy you're going to be as a human being, than how much money you have, what kind of job you get, whether you get into the right school, and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two is to be, I think, my job as a father is to teach my children how to have a positive attitude about it, to be up about things, to not be one more of the people who are down and complaining and full of fault and blame for everybody else. So self-responsibility. I constantly remind my children when they say things like, Billy doesn't like me. You know, they come home and they're really mad. Or, or Sammy, the, my, uh, my girlfriend, said this about me. I always ask them, how do you feel about you? In other words, I want the source of their happiness to be within them. And every example that I can use with them throughout their life, so that if things are going to come along that are going to be disappointing, that are going to be difficult for you to handle, what you've got first and foremost to deal with is you and your own values. If, if uh, you're having trouble in school with your teacher, I never say, oh, the teacher flunked you or she's putting too much pressure on you. I always start with, so you're putting too much pressure on yourself. You're telling yourself, 
Over and over again, it's like self-responsibility for your emotional condition. Then when the things around them that come along, a death in the family, a, a, a divorce perhaps, a, a job, or we have to move here, or we have to change schools or whatever, they have themselves to rely on. That's what I think parenting ought to be about. Michael? You know, well, Brad, in clinical practice, I see a lot of people who haven't learned how to handle stress growing up. This is a very stressful age. There's no way of avoiding stress except to be six feet under, perhaps. I don't recommend that. So we try to raise our kids to learn what I'm teaching clients. And, uh, well, there's one way to look at it. There are three big C's in managing stress. One we've talked about, it's commitment. It's having a sense of purpose and meaning and value in life. So you try and exemplify that and reward it in your kids. The second big C is challenge. The world's full of threats, and if it's full of threats, you're scared and intimidated and beaten down by them. If you can translate those to challenges, then they're manageable, and then it can be upbeat. You can or look, the world is... Yeah, opportunities, opportunities and challenges yeah. around you, and the third C is control. So I really believe that you ought to teach kids some way to relax, some yeah. way to let go, because you can't control often what's going on out there, but you can control what's doing. happening yeah. in here. So if you can give them those three C's, I think you're way ahead in mm -hmm. preparing them for the world out you? there. As a novelist, I feel one of the great themes is, of course, uh, the problem of death, and it seems to me that uh, this is what defines us as human beings, the fact that we know that we're going to die. And uh, it, it is, I think, in Ecclesiastes where it says, love is as strong as death. The only thing I know against death is love. Uh, I think that the terror of death is something that is with us all of our lives. It defines our lives. I think we must allow our children to express this. And what Sigmund Freud once said, if possible to teach ourselves first and our children and perhaps our society, the necessity of becoming friends, if possible, with the idea of our own death. This is a problem which is never solved, and it's an ongoing problem with which we have to wrestle as long as we live. Let's take a call or a question from our audience. Hey, right up front. Yeah, good morning, Fred. Good morning. Uh, this morning we talked about a salary, okay? You're talking about a job. I had a $30,000 job when I worked for the Cleveland Press, and then it folded, you know, and I had to look for other income. Now I'm making 12000 You know, it was hard for me to explain to my children that, you know, that Christmas or the following Christmases, you won't get what you mm -hmm. used to get. And so it was really hard for them to accept that now mom has to go out and work, mm -hmm. you know, when they used to have mom all the way around. Who can, who can uh, say something think, about that? I, I can react to that because I can remember being told no as a kid many, many times that you can't have this and other kids in the neighborhood get these kinds of things. Nobody collapsed. Nobody fell apart. These, this thing that is going on in your life is happening for a reason. Whatever that reason is, I think there's an opportunity in it for you. And you probably will come out ahead of it. Everything that I've ever had that looked bad at the time, whether it was uh, losing a job, moving to another city, even going through a divorce at one time in my life, has all turned out for the better for me. You tell your children that, you don't let yourself get down with that, and, and I think having them hear no is one of the greatest things that they can hear. And knowing that mommy is out there struggling and daddy's trying to put this whole thing together probably will unify you and bring you together more rather than be some negative. I think it's one of the best things they can hurt. It's a very important word, I was, a, I was a depression baby who grew up in a household in which my father tells a story, he literally did not have enough money to get me out of the hospital when I was born, nor to provide milk because my mother couldn't provide it. This was a fact of life. One of the things that seems to me terribly important to realize, first of all, yourself, that you are not responsible, you are not guilty, it is not your fault. It is a fact. And if you can give this sense that you still maintain a sense of worth, uh, this is something that a child picks up and will, will understand. It does not obviate or take away love. Sure. Jo Joe Garagiola says anybody can field a big hop if you can teach him how to field a short hop. It's <laughs> great. Yeah. Let's pause for just a moment. Uh, Jenny's going to update the news, and then we'll come back and find out how to talk to and how to listen to your children. Here's Jenny. Thank you, Fred, and good morning again. In the news, a second high-rise fire erupted in Boston in less than two weeks last night. Hundreds of occupants of an exclusive apartment building were rushed to safety by some 100 firemen. No one was hurt in that blaze. And locally, Cleveland firemen are investigating the origin of a fire that broke out last night on Woodland Avenue. A half a million dollars worth of damage was dealt to Cleveland's food terminal. The picture's not so bright for the Kodak company. It's been found guilty of infringing on patents owned by Polaroid. So now consumers who own Kodak Instant Cameras can return them in exchange for a variety of other items. And finally, some good news for your nose. A nasal spray has been developed that can help prevent you from catching a cold. The only hook is that the spray is quite expensive, about $100 a bottle. Obviously, chicken noodle soup's a lot cheaper, 
But who'd want to spray that up his nose? <laughs> and that's the latest on what's making news right now. I hope you have a great day, and we'll exchange, we'll return tomorrow morning exchange right after. This hour is going quickly. Uh, we want to find out now, uh, how, how, you, you know, we've talked a little bit about talking to your children. How do you listen to your kids? One of the techniques that I've used, uh, and I used it in therapy uh, for years as a, as a therapist, was when a kid asks you something, you were talking about a skit that was being done uh, where the parents were just talking in cliches over and over again on Saturday yes, Night Live. Yeah. Uh, and the kids it, just feel like they're not yeah. being listened to at all. My, my way of communicating with, with the, them or with anyone is to start my sentence with the word you or your rather than with me or I. So if a kid is saying something to you, you respond with, so you're having difficulty. You seem to be having a difficult time with your algebra teacher. You and mommy aren't getting along and perhaps we can't. It's, in other words, don't always focus on you and start on yourself, all right? And because and, when you do that, you instantly want to get into giving a lecture and you want it. And as soon as it's you a give a lecture, right. yeah, yeah, so it's, it's a just wonderful you, point. you, you, your, your, your. Can I just your, add your, one correction yeah. to that one? Because sure. it seems to me you can go awry there. The kid says, I'm having problems in school. You can say, you're not studying hard enough. Oh, no. ah, you can say, you're, you're sleeping all yeah. day. You're you, a lazy, you, no yeah, good bum. Right. You want to focus on the, on the feeling behind right. that, yeah. You, you yeah. want to yeah. focus on, yeah. on the feeling. And if you mm -hmm. can listen that way, listen to feelings. And that means yeah. for me, of course, as I know it does for you, listening with your eyes mm -hmm. as well as with your ears, because an awful lot of the really important communication in life, how you're feeling about yourself. You know, you're sitting like this, mm -hmm. or you're sitting up strong. How are you feeling about another person? You look them in the eye and talk to them. It's, it's listening it's without to the words. rock music that drives me nuts. I have to tell you. MTV. <laughs> On MTV. Oh, right. well. Yeah, the first thing you do is get the Walkman off. I think you also have to be, I mean, instead of always being a teacher, you have to be a learner. And if you can assume well, that posture with your children, in other words, what is your day like? What are your struggles like? What's going on inside of you? Even when you, even at night, well, I try to, and I've got so, so damn many kids that it's hard to get this all done. Yes. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'll go from room to room and just talk to them, even to the, to the two-year-old, just about what their day was like, just for a second. Like, learn about their life and their struggles, rather than always lecturing and giving them you your point of view. understanding. Parents, mm -hmm. I think, often feel they have to have an answer, and yeah. they put great pressure on themselves to be the expert and give the answer. And they don't want it. You know, our little grandson's playing the other day, and then he really starts kind of bugging me, saying, I want to I play the Sinodor. I want to play the Sinodor. Hey, Sinodor, what's he talking about? <laughs> yeah. Finally, we go around, and remember, we've been down at the museum, and he's been on the dinosaur yeah. out there. And I say, aha, you'd like to play yeah. with the dinosaur. Yep. Yeah. And then he's fine. He's happy. Yeah. You don't need to say, we will do it, we won't right. do it. He goes back that, to playing that, with what he's playing with. He famous, wants to be understood. Uh, the famous old story of the uh, little kid who wants to ask his mother where he comes from. And the mother just starts worrying and consumed with, what do I say? I don't know if I can talk, say vagina, can I say? And she goes into it. He said, oh, I know all of that. I just want to know where I came from. Billy came from Cleveland, and I wasn't sure where you came from. <laughs> it's like, you can exactly. give them way too many lectures yeah. when all they want is a simple little answer. Lectures, yeah, sure. yeah. The, the uh, Get that you referred to on Saturday Night Live was a situation where a young girl, a teenager, came to the father and wanted to tell the father something important about breaking up with her boyfriend. And uh, every time she would start to uh, broach the subject, he'd say, well, that's the way the old ball bounces. He would make some cliche. And, and the subtext of that was, I don't want to have to deal with your problem. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us have done that with our kids. Oh. You know, they I, come to I, you in tears and say, oh, it'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm busy. I've got, you're writing a novel. I've got things I want to do. And if you're always communicating with your children all the time, then that can become a full-time job. You'll never get anything done. So there are times when you just want to say to them, look, go ask your mother, <laughs> you know, or whatever. But I think if you just stop and, and, and do that listening kind of thing, just, just for a second, and let them know that you think that they're important. And then say, look, Daddy's got, I've got work to do. I've got these things that I'm... I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, you don't... I don't think you owe 100% of your life all the time to your children either. And you ought not to be feeling guilty because you have other things that are important for you no, to but do. But you need to give them gifts. And that's the greatest gift you can give is yourself. You're listening, you're attending, you're understaning. And, and I suppose as you do, I'm guilty at times of saying I have important work. Yeah. Which <laughs> what is, you're doing oh, is well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't count. You're not <laughs> yeah, important. Yeah. And that's it. I don't recommend that. One of the things that I've learned, perhaps to sum up my feelings, to try and inculcate in your child um, as a father, is without saying it, but by somehow demonstrating love, it seems to me that what we must do is give a child a sense that their lives are more important than ours, and essentially that we are willing to sacrifice ourselves in a deeper sense for them. If a child, I grew up with parents who implicitly gave me that message. 
And it was an immense message of strength. And if I could possibly convey that to my children, that in, in some way, without articulating specifically, that I am willing to give of myself totally and sacrifice myself for their life and for, for their ongoing life, it seems to me that is a gift that I would like to give. We need to take a break here. When we come back, I'm going to ask each of you to say in a few uh, lines uh, what it is that makes a good father. We'll be right back. on eight packs of Slice, Pepsi, or Pepsi Free, $1.59. A four-roll package of Cottonelle or a 280-count box of Scotties, 99 cents. Lean, meaty, Western-style pork ribs, 99 cents a pound. And enjoy extra savings this week on half and full case purchases during Pick and Pay's case sale. Pick and Pay. tribal chief and a governor's daughter. Just love me. Lovers from different worlds committing the ultimate act of passion. I want every native to know that the boy has committed murder. He'll hang for it. Dino De Laurentiis' epic tale of desire and disaster. Starring Max von Sydow, Trevor Howard, Timothy Bottoms, Jason Robards, and Mia Farrow. I love him. The motion picture adventure, Hurricane. Late night Friday. Catch Elvis, Sunday at 5. Plants and flowers on Morning Exchange are provided and maintained by Alexander's Flowers and Plants, with eight locations in the Cleveland area. A little summing up. I guess uh, one of the important things about being a good father is knowing when to let go. What do you think, Michael? You've had to let go of a few. Well, we have had to let go. Uh, parenthood is one of those jobs that you succeed in if the uh, business goes away. So you're preparing the whole while to let the kid leave, and it should be the last final step. But when you're asking, you know, what makes a good father, I really have a fairly simple answer. And the first one is good kids. Good kids vary. So good father comes from good kids, good mother, good intentions, good effort based on those intentions, and good luck. What do you think? I would agree. Good luck. <laughs> good luck is very, a very important aspect. Uh -huh. I would say that uh, my hope is that I will give my children a sense of their own worth and a sense that they will be able to exist in a universe where there is death, where there is despair, where there is economic setbacks, uh, and that they will be able to deal with this as autonomous functioning people, and that they will be able in turn to love. And Wayne, what do you say? I say par uh, parents are not for leaning. They are to make leaning unnecessary. That was Sarah Caldfield Fisher, and I really, I try to remember that all the time. What I want for my children is them to be independent, as they grow up. I want them to be creative. I want them to live a lifetime of wellness. I want them to honor and value themselves as human beings. I want them to have self-confidence in what they do. I want them to be risk takers. I don't want them to be afraid of failing or afraid of anything in their lives. So it's like what I try always to, to engender in them is a sense of that I am a valuable human being. And I want them to really believe that first and foremost. And then I think they're prepared to handle anything. Randy? All right, gentlemen, you've listened to all this advice. Parents at home, good parents, a good mother, good father. Sounds good, but it doesn't work out. What happens if you, if you do it, indeed, all of what you have just said, and they still turn out on drugs, alcohol, not good kids? I don't think so. I think those are just not good choices, and I think that they have to see that, that uh, you can't go around living your life based upon whether your children do or not do make uh, choices that aren't effective for them. And you, you try to guide them. In a poem that my mother wrote to me at the beginning of my book about children, she said, a parent can but guide, then step aside. And if they decide to go other ways, that's where they are on the path. And you can't be seeing yourself as a failure and feeling guilty because they make if those choices. If they're still in teenage, you get some help. And yes. you don't blame yourself, because blaming yourself just adds another problem, and two problems are worse than the first one alone. And Lou? Well, yeah, that was my question. How do you deal with all of that frustration when things aren't working out? You have a 12-year-old not behaving, years go on, the problems get more difficult, yet you, you think you're doing all you can possibly do. Do you simply at that point go and get professional help? Sure, you go get yes. professional help, and you acknowledge that you've had lousy luck. You know, we've had good luck, and I'm very grateful for that. I know other people have done a better job of child-rearing than I've done, and they've had bad luck and so they have to demonstrate to their kids that they can cope with that stress and then get somebody else to assist them in managing the problems 
We are very lucky to live at a time in which acute psychological insights have been promulgated. And there are therapists out there, there are people out there to help. And not to be ashamed to get help. Not to be ashamed to say, look, I am helpless in a situation. Let me go to somebody and see if I can't work this out. And Wayne, you want to have a final word? Well, I, my reaction to that is that I, don't, I let my children know that I don't live my life through them. That I, that I try to model what it is that I can do. And if they make choices that are going against them, that they're going to have to take the consequences of it. Daddy isn't going to have a nervous breakdown because you decide to live, make neurotic choices. I let them know that. Wayne has written uh, this book, which is called What Do You Really Want for Your Children? And Hugh Nissenson, who is a novelist, has written this marvelous book. It is set in Mansfield, Ohio, in the early part of the last century. It's called The Tree of Life. Uh, and uh, he's a father, but uh, his kids leave him alone when he's writing, which is why this is so good. Uh, he's going to be at Undercover Books at 11.30 yes, this morning. That's out at the Van Aken Center in Shaker Heights, a wonderful bookstore. And uh, say hello to the Turners for me. Certainly and will. you might drop by and visit with him there, Hugh Nissenson. And Michael, who's been with us so frequently over the past 13 and a half years of the Morning Exchange. Michael, thank you very much. Yes, I remember Evan was on when he was <laughs> That's right. Years old. Just a mere youth when he was toddling in here. Yeah. I think we all did something right. And we just, uh, as you say, a lot of it is luck. But you've got to keep working at it. Oh, yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to the audience who joined us here today. Hope it was helpful. We'll be right back. Thank you. you go for excitement Saturday night, January 18th, to your TV set for Weekend with the Stars telethon for cerebral palsy. You'll be amazed by our lineup. In a perfect world, every stain would be seen and reported. But in the real world, most stains go unreported, right through the wash and into your dryer, where they could be set for life. But add Biz Bleach to your detergent and you have a strong second line of defense to catch many unreported stains and remove them before it's too late. In an imperfect world, pin your hopes on this. Unreported stains can't get by Biz.